I have to be honest, I'm a little bit tense. Ever, whenever it involves Titaletti, I feel I'm before a, a very stern taskmaster. And we, we're talking about an icon. And uh, mm. we also have another icon in, in the person of our MC, Mr. Chelas. I think I have two mentors and two taskmasters that I have to do my best for tonight. The difficult thing about having so many people come before me is the fact that they have likely said everything there is to say. My job now becomes even more of a challenge, especially since we are here to pay tribute to a man, to a woman, sorry, to whom words matter very much. Of course, my task is complicated all the more by the unique relationship that Tita Letty and I had. I say Tita because not only was she close to my mother, it is also the honorific we attach to the names of the people we hold in esteem. The high regard I had for her, combined with her lifelong profession, made it a little challenging to interact with her. In fact, I can probably count the number of times I was able to truly let what's left of my hair down and speak more or less freely around her. Tita Letty, after all, was first and foremost a journalist. She had a keen eye for a story, and that sixth sense that all exemplary journalists possess. I would be remiss if I failed to pay tribute to that aspect of her life tonight, particularly because it is so intertwined with the history of our country and the life of our family. Everyone knows we are, we are in a democracy, everyone is entitled to be interrupted. Everyone knows that she was one of the stalwarts of the Mosquito Press. Tita Letty was among the women who at times were seemingly braver than the men in standing up to the dictatorship. Under her watch, the panorama transformed from an innocuous, from an innocuous Sunday magazine into a publication that dared to question the regime to the extent that the dictator and his minions perceived its pages as a threat. For writing about the truth, for exposing the ugliness of martial law, Tita Letty lost her job. This did not embitter her, it emboldened her. What one newspaper lost Philippine journalism and the reading public gain. When Tita Egepostol asked Tita Letty to join the team behind Mr. and Ms. Special Edition, that publication made history as it dared to chronicle what the controlled media denied. Tita Letty and the rest of her colleagues added the roar of the printing press to the clanking of mimeograph machines copying banned articles. The whirring of Betamax machines making prohibited copies of foreign news reports and the marching of feet from Time Street all the way to the staff elections. It was at this time that Tita Egi felt that there was a need for a truly independent broadsheet to challenge the controlled press. Out of the dictatorship, the premier broadsheet of today was born with Tita Letty not only willingly on board, but giving the publication its name, the Inquirer. The dictator went into the staff election not only with guns, goons, and gold, but with a controlled press to sing him praises. Even then, he knew that the buzz of the mosquito press had turned into a thunderous roar for democracy, for truth, for justice. In a matter of weeks, the Marcos dictatorship ended at Edsa. It was at that moment that the inquiry established itself as a country's journal of record, with the headline that summed it all up. It's all over, Marcos, please. I'm not here, however, to talk of her achievements. We already know the breadth and depth of what she has done. While it is true that especially in the past few years, there was a clear demarcation between the personal and professional sides of our relationship, I can tell all of you, Tita Letty was always so human that it fostered respect, trust, and thus closeness. <laughs> to give you one example, on her birthday last September, I sent her some wine, which she said she liked very much. She even sent me a text message as a thank you of sorts, and I quote, whoever advised you to get this wine sure knows his wine, close quote. Excuse me. That text showed just how much she knew me. Every Christmas, I tend to receive alcoholic beverages from people who want to be my friend. But if they were truly my friend, they would know that I do not drink unless forced to, for example, during doses at state banquets. On the opposite end of the spectrum, though there are those who are decidedly not my friends, who like to spread rumors that I am, of all things, a drunkard. Tita Letty was firmly in the former camp. 
a good enough friend that you could say thank you while poking fun at my lack of qualifications to personally select the vintage of that gift. Our relationship was such that I was quite disappointed to learn that she would not be at the 30th anniversary of the inquiry. I sent her a message inquiring about her health, and she replied, explaining the chronic condition she suffered from. I probably even suggested that she see my own physicians for the problem. But Tita Leti was never one to wallow, and she quickly shifted the conversation back to the inquiry. Everyone knows she always put greater causes before her own welfare. Many of her colleagues three would say that she was working even while bedridden. Her last very passionate request to me was that I support her son's advocacy for the Philippines to have its own official film archive and cinema. Unfortunately, on that day, it was necessary to monitor Typhoon North. She graciously understood, but repeated, the importance of her son's advocacy. During my administration, I believe I interacted with Italetti more than any other member of the media. That does not mean, of course, that she or the inquirer enjoyed unlimited access. Italetti was conscious that she represented the fourth estate, and I, the government and the nation's interests. That kind of knowledge breeds tension in both parties. She, as a journalist, was always out for a scoop, and also always aware that friendliness must never become partisanship. On my part, as president, I am duty-bound not to blame favorites with the press, and that furthermore, even as I have the duty to keep the public well and truly informed, I also have an obligation to ensure that this information is situated in its proper context. At the Inquirer 30th anniversary, I express my thanks for it being one of the media outlets who cooperated with government in preventing panic at the time when we were guarding against the threat of the MERS coronavirus. Now that we can look back and say that the handling of the situation was a success, I ask, would it have served a purpose if I had let Italetti and the Inquirer in on the minute? Would it have helped if I had informed them that the Filipino had tested positive was already on its way to Bicol and that the list of airplane passengers we had to seek out had almost doubled in number? Had I done that and the Inquirer reported it, is it not reasonable to assume that panic might have ensued? These were the kinds of scenarios that were always on my mind. As president, every sentence I speak has consequences, perhaps even more so when I speak to media. That is why every time I spoke with Italetti, I was a bit guarded, and she was probing, but never to the point of fostering conflict. This I can attribute to her consummate professionalism and, of course, her more nurturing side. I always thought that June 30, 2016 would allow for a shift in our relationship so that I would no longer have to be on my guard and she would no longer need to call me Mr. President. On Christmas Eve, less than a week ago, I was in a rather sentimental and reflective mood. While hearing Mass with my family, excuse me. While hearing Mass with my family, I could not help but think of the people we had lost this year. Tita Pasi, my mom's younger sister, the kind of aunt who can discipline you while being considered one of the gang for her thesis and efforts. There was Tito Butch, who always sought to preserve family unity and who stepped up to serve the public after my father was killed. And then there was Bob Fiona, who only some of you would have known. He was with me in the most dangerous times as a trusted member of my security detail. Bong, in just a matter of months, was diagnosed with and died of cancer wasting away before our very eyes to the very end, refusing to ask anything of me who owed him so very much. You can imagine my shock when during our Noche Buena, the news came that Italetti had passed away. She was an institution, and with institutions, you tend to forget that they are also people with a beginning and an end. Even if I knew she had a chronic condition, there was the belief that like every other instance of her having an illness, she would bounce back livelier and more feisty than ever. There was a period of disbelief, tinged with sadness for the passing of such an icon. What stopped me out of my depression were the vivid memories of her. For instance, if you would ask me to describe her, the image of the famed German nuns from St. Scholasticus or the Irish priest from Ateneo always come to mind. I am sure all of us have had mentors and teachers we consider terrors. You know, I guess what I mean. Tita Letty could give you the kind of look that would turn the blood in your veins to ice. 
at once direct, intimidating, and soul-searching. Every time she looked at me like that, I couldn't help but think that a major sermon was in the offing. Thankfully, that never happened. At some point, she would always break out either with a smile or a very infectious laughter. Of course, given the intensity of her signature look, it always took me a few seconds to realize that she was finally smiling, at which point I could finally relax and return the gesture. For Titan Letty's truest and deepest nature was of a nurturer with a heart of gold. A nurturer who was still tough precisely because she expected you to meet the challenge of her very high expectations. Every time she spoke to me in the terse tones that marked her as a true professional, my blood pressure probably rose at least five points. Which is funny because those were also the times when I felt like a college student again. One of my economics professors in Ateneo was an especially brilliant man who seemed to enjoy making life hard for me. Three times a week, the last 15 minutes of every class was reserved for an intensive debate solely with me. I felt that he had it in it for me and that passing the class was not a possibility. Eventually, I learned that the reason my professor was challenging me in this way was because he admired my father greatly and that he wanted to train me to be a sharp minister. In the end, I got a B plus, but that was because my professor could not finish teaching the course due to his health problems. I'd like to think that he would have given me an A if we had been able to finish the semester, because he probably held back the final grade so that I would continue to keep striving. With Titaletti, I'd like to think that her smiles indicated that she was pleased at how I was rising to the challenges confronting me. <coughs> and the shampoo of my answers and my efforts. In that sense, perhaps, I drew some of her motherly instincts to the forefront. Having read the tributes written by a number of writers in the choir, that seems to be an experience we all share in common. Everyone who interacted with her learned something from her, whether lessons in the newsroom or more informal ones. Such as the fact that for me, I found out that the song, You Are My Sunshine, actually has more than one verse. A privileged few learned this and witnessed Titaletti singing all four verses of the song after the state banquet for President Francois Hollande of France. All of us will have different memories of these light moments. Especially tonight, we recall these moments fondly and treasure them just as much as the times we worked with the Teleti, which was a different kind of experience altogether. That is, of course, because of the fact that whether in the newsroom or elsewhere, Tita Leti took the ethics of her vocation very seriously. While our conversations might have seemed more like interviews, I knew that if I said that certain topics were off the record, they would remain as such. However, it also became leads from which she could approach other sources and come up with the same story. Therefore, if I felt the timing wasn't correct, my default position was just to try and keep my mouth shut, which was very difficult with Italy. She was also someone I trusted to give me the perspective of media, because I always tried to put myself in the shoes of the other in order to understand them more fully and come to a good discussion. I knew I could count on her honest, uncensored opinion. This trademark professionalism and fearlessness left its mark on the inquiry, which has long been a broadsheet unafraid to speak truth to power and expose alleged drug food. The inquiry's drive may be too much for some people who might be tempted to gravitate to another newspaper, feeling that the inquirer was a little disruptive to their tranquil mornings. For my part, I consider the inquiry to be my equivalent of 10 cups of coffee in the morning, and this from a dedicated non-coffee drinker. Kidding aside, I've always appreciated the manner in which the inquirer has worked fearless yet balanced. This balance and fearlessness also meant that I was never exempt from being criticized. There were days when the inquirer was purely negative. There were days when it was 50-50. What I could always count on was that with Titanetti, the paper would always be reasonable, which was reflected in my interactions with its staff. For example, the last time I had occasion to meet with Enquirer editors and reporters in all of its formats, 
Titaletti included, I found the discussion extremely stimulating, challenging, but undoubtedly positive. I cannot but help but contrast this to an interview I had with another media personality. At the end of her questioning, as I was taking my leave, she said that it was very hard to provoke me to anger. And my immediate reaction was to ask myself, was that it? She just wants to make news as opposed to getting newsworthy information. I couldn't help but think that if it was just a game to her, if an adverse reaction from me was all she wanted, then the entire interview was such a waste of time. Tita Letty made sure that the inquirer was vastly different from media outlets like this. No one knew better how to write snappy headlines, yet at the same time, she did so knowing that headlines in her corresponding stories must herald not mere innuendo, but rather an incontrovertible marshalling of the facts. She probably faced constant temptation in how to wield the power that she held as editor-in-chief, yet she stuck to the very simple principles that there is a right and there is a wrong. When Tita Letty was around, I knew that my side, the government side, would be heard not because she was my friend, but because she wanted to do right by the Filipino people. One of the inquirer's columnists, Professor Danny David, wrote that the relationship between government and media is one of mutual irritation. There were never moments of irritation for me with the Italian. Some of you might think this is exaggerated for the, purpose, for the purposes of this gathering, but it is the truth. I can remember no time in which I bore a grudge against her or harbored dissent. What has always been clear to me was that she had dedicated her entire life to the Philippines and its people. When we hold someone in such high regard, when we put them among the pantheon of our heroes, we tend to forget that they are human, like us, with their own fears, doubts, and moments of weakness. Like us, they had to answer difficult questions. In her case, do I want the dictatorship, excuse me, do I want the dictatorship to go after me? How do I keep championing the right admits so much wrong? Tita Letty was among those who confronted those difficult questions, rose to the challenge, and chose to do the right thing. In that regard, perhaps, she would have modestly insisted she was unique. She was not unique. But without doubt, we can agree she was exemplary. Whether in the Mr. and Ms. Special Edition or the Inquirer, Tita Letty never sought power, prestige, or privilege. The courage, idealism, and optimism she displayed in her work were all born of a deep and abiding love for her country and her countrymen. After her passing, one of her mutual friends told me that she felt like an orphan. It struck a chord in me because I am also an orphan. Perhaps you will allow me to draw some balance. The loss of Tita Letty for her family, both at home and at the Inquirer, was like the loss of her father. Our leader was gone. We did not know how to go on. Perhaps you felt this way in the past few days. That is only to be expected. Such news will always leave us shocked, sad, and greedy. At the same time, we can be so absorbed in our loss that we forget the impact she has had on our lives. That there are many more letties, some of them in this very gathering, who will continue what was left unfinished. This work is not just for leaders, editors, and writers, but also, and more importantly, for readers. Vitaletti believed as much, saying, as today's Inquirer editorial quoted, and I quote, Indeed, in the world of news, it takes two to tell the truth. We in the media have the responsibility to report the news accurately, and with fairness, which follows accuracy, and completely subject to space and deadlines. Your responsibility as readers is to keep yourselves informed. Remember that in this country of dangerous uncertainties and of many disasters, natural and man-made, what you don't know can give it to school. Having heard the challenge she issued, should we allow ourselves to grieve, grieve so fully? Or should we be happy and thankful that once there was someone like Leti Meris Monsano who set out on a mission early in her life and even in death will continue to inspire others to pursue that mission. I believe someone who lived their life to the absolute fullest would not want to be the cause of so much mourning. Standing here before you, I am reminded of Og Mandela's words in The Greatest Salesman in the World. And I quote again, I will live this day as if it is my last, 
I will not waste a moment's morning, a moment, sorry, a moment morning yesterday's misfortunes, yesterday's defeats, yesterday's aches of the heart, for why should I throw good after bad? Why have I been allowed to live this extra day when others far better than I have departed? Is it that they have accomplished their purpose while mine is yet to be achieved? Close quote. I can see that signature look on Tita Leti's face now, direct, probing, as if she were asking us how we will continue her work, how we will raise the standard of discourse in the country, how we will help lift the Philippines to greater heights. When we are able to answer, when we can meet Tita Leti once again, I know that intimidating, intimidating look will melt into a warm and proud smile because we have indeed taken up the task at hand. We have done our part. Just as I said to that friend who felt as if she had been orphaned by Titaletti's passing, I asked, can we really ask for more from those who have given so much already? From here on out, our prayer should be one of thanks for her life, securing the knowledge that she was true to our people and to our God, enjoying her just rewards. In the same way that I spoke of this in my eulogies for my mother and for Jesse Redwood, and for others who have gone before us. Here is another who can say in the words of St. Paul in his letter to David, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Thank you. Good evening.